Uh, we continue to study the Word of God from the book of Romans. And uh, we are now in chapter 8. We come to verse 5 through 8. And the title of our message today is simple. It's how to live. So please turn to God's word. Let's read the first uh, uh, 11 verses. Please hear the word of God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by setting his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh Set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the flesh. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, and my friends, you who is a non-believer, I want you to know this morning that there are only two ways to live. Only two ways to live. I don't mean that there is the rich and the poor, therefore that's a way to live in poverty or in riches. I mean there is living in the flesh and living in the Spirit. And I want to assure you that there are no alternatives. There are no alternatives. You are either in the flesh or in the Spirit. Now, living in the flesh is living according to how you were born. Living according to the way of Adam. And the Bible says to live in the flesh is death. So even though you are alive, the Bible says you are dead. And then there is living in the spirit, which is life, being in Christ. And people who live to the flesh, as well as those who live in the spirit of God, are described in the text before us. These four verses speak about and from the verses before us, we can deduce that believers can keep the law of God because of the power of the Spirit within them. That's what verse 4 says. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who are in the flesh think of things of the flesh. How can, they, how can they think of anything else? They are in the flesh. Thankfully, those who are regenerated by the Spirit think of the things of the Spirit because they are in the Spirit. 
So it is true to say that we believers keep the law or fulfill the law by the help of the Spirit. And unbelievers are unable to keep the law precisely because they lack, they lack the help of the Spirit. Let's begin by defining our terms. What is flesh and what is spirit? Flesh. When we talk about flesh, it does not refer to the, to the soft tissue, the soft muscular tissue that cover our bones. That's not the flesh we are talking about there. And it does not refer to bodily appetites. Instead, Paul uses the word flesh here to refer to the fallen human nature or the condition of being unregenerate. It could also be taken to mean the fallen egocentric human nature as defined by Martin Luther. So the flesh then is dominated and controlled and led by sin. And the flesh therefore refers to unbelievers. It refers to unbelievers. It does not refer to people who claim to be Christians because they go to church, because they know how to sing, because they give, because they pray. It's not talking about the so-called nominal Christians. No. The flesh there refers to unbelievers. And spirit, Paul uses this term to refer to the, not to the spirit that is in us or the soul. No. He's not talking about our inner being. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. When the Holy Spirit regenerates a sinner, he remains in, in, in that person. He indwells the person and controls that person. The Spirit leans and helps them to obey God and to please God. And so in the next sermon, Verse 9 through verse 11, we will see, God willing, that if you claim to be a Christian and you do not have the Spirit of God, you're a liar. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Verse 9. Those who have the Spirit are the regenerates, the believers, the Christians. But you notice that there is, there is a very tight tension between the flesh and the spirit. It can be described as the tension between now um, Ryla and Ruto in the pendulum that has been going back and forth in the last few days. Maybe this is even higher, the tension between the flesh and the spirit described here. And this is not the only place where Paul describes this tension. It says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the desires of the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is this, this tension between the spirit and the flesh. He then goes on to describe the works of the flesh in verse 19 to 21 to show that there is a contrast, a clear contrast between the two. A contrast of those who live according to the flesh. And those who live according to the flesh can literally be said, can be translated, those 
of the flesh. So in a sense, a verb ought not to be supplied in that phrase. Uh, according to the Greek, there shouldn't be any verb. This is what we call a phrasal noun. A phrasal noun has an adjective and a noun. So they are put together. So those of the flesh, that is, they belong to the flesh. And then those who live according to the spirit are those of the spirit. That is, those who are in the spirit, of the spirit, led by the spirit, controlled by the spirit. And it's obvious in both texts that these are two contrasting people. The people live, those who live according to their nature, the sinful nature, the flesh, and then those who live in and of by the Spirit. And as, again, I repeat, there are no alternatives. You know, uh, you know the way the Kenyans would say, how are you, Niko Nusu Nusu? Isn't it? You've heard that phrase. There's nothing like that. You're neither there nor there. No, there, there, there are no alternatives. And your behavior or your conduct is consistent to your nature. Your conduct is consistent to your nature. And it involves either the flesh or the spirit. It is these two natures that guide and control you. And do you know how they control you? They give you a mindset. So the Bible uses here the mind that is set on the flesh. That's to say, it gives you a perspective because everyone lives according to their perspectives. To put it differently, everyone lives according to their worldview. So, what is your worldview? So you are consistent in, uh, with your nature. You are consistent in your conduct with your worldview, with your mindset, with your perspective, life perspective. These two then, uh, these two natures then guide and control your thinking, your desires your appetites, your emotions. This controls your every aspect. So your worldview is in accordance to your nature. Two things to say here. Number one, do not live according to the flesh. Don't. Don't live according to the flesh. Why should you shun fleshly living? That's the way. Because to live according to the flesh is death. That's what the Bible says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Listen to this verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit of uh, is life and peace. In other words, to live according to the flesh is not to live at all. The way to pursue death is to live to please and gratify the flesh. 
Second question. What is fleshly living? It is to set your minds on the things of the flesh. When you pursue such interests and pursuits that seek to gratify the desires and the passions of the flesh, then you are living according to the flesh and you are dead. If you continue to concern yourself with the same appetites as you did when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, then you are living according to the flesh. You well know that Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So the, the, that verse tells you that even though dead, you walk. And how do you walk? Three things are given there in Ephesians 2, verse 2, verse 3. First of all, if you're dead in your trespasses and sins, the Bible says that you walked according to the course. Of this world. You follow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is not work among the sons of disobedience. If you are dead in your trespasses, you are not inactive. You are walking. You are following. You are even, the Bible says in verse 3, you are living among uh, you are living in the passions of your flesh according, uh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of man. So, those who are dead in their trespasses are active, active in the flesh, but dead in the spirit. Active in the sense that they follow the world. Active in the sense that they listen to the evil one. The prince who is at work now among the sons of disobedience. And they are also active in the world. Because they live in the passions of their flesh. They carry out the desires of the body. They carry out the desires of the mind. They are by nature children of wrath. So your mindsets and perspectives express your nature. Your mindset, your perspective, your worldview express your nature, whether that of a Christian or that of a non-Christian. The mindset of a non-Christian is set to please their fleshly nature. When your nature desires A, you give it A. You don't even argue. What your nature desires is what you pursue. What you like more or what you have appetite for is what defines your pursuit and your ambitions. No one can act against their nature. No one. No one can act against their nature. Whether in the animal kingdom, or in the plant kingdom. No one can act against their nature. Lions eat meat. They are carnivores. What is very interesting is that there is a lot of grass. If you went to Nairobi National Park right now, you'd see lots of grass. It may be a little dry right now. But the lions are not interested whatsoever in that grass. They have to act according to their nature. And so they, even though the food that they, their nature desires is very fast, they will run after it because it is in accordance to their nature. They cannot do otherwise. They will not say the gazelles are too fast. Just leave them alone. Let them eat grass. They would insist on running after one gazelle after another until they capture one of them. 
the same way with you. If your nature is fleshly, it cannot pursue spiritual things. So you have to act according to your nature. And the third question is, what is the result of living according to the flesh? Your mindset demonstrates your nature, but there are consequences of living according to that fleshly nature. There are consequences. The mind that is set on the flesh produces two tragic things, two tragic results. For one, it is death. Because the Bible says to set your mind to the things of the flesh is death. Set your mind on the flesh is death. A mindset that is controlled by the flesh is already moving to one's its end. And that is death. Spiritual death. Spiritual death is the eternal death. Once one is dead spiritually, the only hope is life-giving spirit. And if one rejects the spirit, then there is no more hope but eternal death. We all were born, sadly, in this nature, in this condition of spiritual death. We were born like that. That's why Paul tells the Ephesians, and you Ephesians were by, uh, you were dead. You were dead. That's what you were. You used to be dead. Even Paul puts himself there. I also, he says, along with them, we followed. Along with them. We once were lost in sin and darkness. We once were all slaves to sin. And the devil. We all were blind to the promises of the gospel. We lived according to that awful condition of death because we're in the flesh. This consequence eventually confer is confirmed after death, where people go to the torment of Hades and eventually to hell. But for us, God had mercy upon us. And God has mercy upon you too. That's why he would have you this morning hear the promises of the gospel so that you may believe and live. That's the first consequence. It's death. The second consequence is hostility to God. Flesh alienates a person from God. Because you see, Fleshly appetites are sinful, and the wages of sin is death, and those who set their minds on the flesh are hostile to God. That's what you read there. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. As soon as Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, what did they do? They ate from God marking the hostility between them in their sin and God who is holy. The hostility to God is both deliberate and it is also an inability. It's both willful, because we read here that for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. What is Paul saying there? He's saying, he's saying two things. First of all, he's saying that, and these are the indicators of hostility to God. First of all, is that there is unwillingness to submit to God's law. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. 
And here then you see that there is a willful refusal to obey God's law by the unregenerate. They hate God's law. Sometimes they do not even recognize the law of God as a moral standard of their life. They suppress the truth, is what Paul told us earlier in chapter 1, verse 18. They suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Although they know God, they do not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Instead, they, became, they become futile in their thinking and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and exchange the glory of God for those images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping creatures. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship the creature rather than the creator, God, who is blessed forever. And for this reason, what did God do with them? He gave them up to their debased minds. He gave them up to their awful natural appetites and hor horrible cravings. But this is not only a willful refusal, but also it is that they cannot, they lack the ability. Because the Bible says here that indeed it cannot, it lacks the ability, is not able. So they conduct themselves like, the, like that because this is their nature. Their sinful nature renders them unable and incapable of submitting to God's law. See, total inability to obey or submit to God's law is a problem that affects all unbelievers because of their condition. Why is it that a fish cannot climb a tree? It's because of its nature. There is no way a fish can climb a tree. So that sinful nature or the depraved nature read us, seen us, totally unable to do otherwise. So your attitude to God, your attitude to his law and his ways is informed by your nature. The, the reason why you love sin and encourage sinful appetite may be because you are unregenerate. Yes, I know there are times when uh, we are tempted and because of, us, of our weaknesses, we entertain sinful temptations and even indulge in the flesh. But this is not our way of life. And the Holy Spirit of God in us helps us to see it, and to hate it, and to repent of it. But if you're ever wallowing in the same sinful nature, sinful appetites, instead of battling and wrestling and killing them, all those passions of the flesh in your life, then why should we believe that you are regenerate? The tree that does not produce good fruit has to be cut down and destroyed because it's worth nothing. Its destruction is in the lake of fire, in hell. So, do not live according to the flesh. Because that is death, and that is hostility to God, and this is not your favor. This is not your profit. This is not your advantage. Stop it. Please, you who is not saved, I'm talking, stop living according to the flesh. And do you, you know what is the appropriate response to that requirement? Do not live according to the flesh. What is your, what is the rightful response? Yes? The rightful response is 
not I will try. Because that's what many unbelievers say. I will try. Oh, pastor, I've had you. You said I do not continue to live according to the flesh. You have advised me very well. I will take your counsel seriously. If that's your thinking right now, you have not understood at all. Your response is, I can't. Do you hear that? Because you can't. I already told you, and you've already read from the Bible, that those who are in the flesh do not submit to God's law. In fact, they cannot. So when a law like that is, is given, do not live according to the flesh. Your response is, the Bible just said, I can't. Okay? Because you can't. So where does your hope lie? It is not in your nature. Because your nature is sinful that it cannot do anything else. It cannot submit to God's law. That's what we just read. It cannot. And so your response then is, then how can I get out of this condition of sin? How can, you, how can I get out of this sinful nature? How can I get out of the flesh? The way to get out of the flesh is not trying, but trusting in someone else to do it for you. Because if this is something that you can't do, then you need to call out someone else to help you, to deliver you, to get you out of that condition. Imagine you find yourself Fallen into a pit. And you try getting out. You try, you try and all your nails come out in the process of trying to get out. Till the, the tips of your fingers get sore. What should you do? You should call out for help. Because you can't. You look for someone else who is not in the pit with you. You call out for help. And you shout all the most, help me. Help me. And if you compare yourself with the blind Bartimaeus there by the, the gates of Jericho, and you've heard that Jesus, the son of David, is passing by, and he is here right now, you should be shouting all the more. Have mercy upon me, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy. Have mercy. That should be what you can be doing. Trusting in his merit. Because all the fitness he requires is you to feel your need of him. He is able to save you. He is able to save you. He is able to save you. Doubt no more. Yes. So. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him by faith. And he is willing. Two Sundays ago, we had a sermon from our dear brother Paul from Matthew 11, verse 28. And the Lord says, Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will, it says, I will give you rest. So he's both able and willing to get you out of this flesh. Doubt no. He's willing. Go to him. He'll save you. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, 
I will by no means cut. Face that. Stop continuing to live according to God. And the way to stop it is trusting Jesus Christ to deliver you. Second thing. So I've told you, even you believers, stop living according to the flesh. Don't give the flesh any ground in your life. Don't. And the only way out is to live according to the Spirit. Live according to the Spirit. Thankfully, believers are not in the flesh to gratify its desires. Amen? The works of the flesh are inconsistent with the spiritual things because the flesh is always sinful. And the works of the flesh are described there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. The works of the flesh are evident. What are they? It's sexual immorality. It is impurity. Any impurity in the mind or in your appetites. It is sensuality. You know, wanting to just see that we like, hear what, what tantalizes you, smell what you taste, you know, sensuality. Living, living according to your senses. It is idolatry. It is sorcery. I hope there is no sorcery here. It's enmity. Some of you have enmity. It is strife. Certainly, strife can sometimes be found in churches of Jesus Christ to our shame. There must be no strife because it is flesh. It is jealousy. It's feats of anger. It's impurity. It is, uh, excuse me, it's rivalries and dissensions and divisions and envy, even drunkenness. I hope there are no drunkards here. It's orgies. Some things are hard even to describe. And things like this. I warn you, the Bible says, I warn you. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how convinced they are. The Bible says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's final. Those who indulge in such have no hope of eternal life. How can, how can God wink at sexual immorality and impurity or sensuality? No way. God is infinitely holy and can have nothing to do with idolatry or enmity or rivalry. No way. No way. A deceased soul only bears the fruit of strife and malice and jealousy and fits of anger and rivalry. And ascensions, the divisions, the drunkenness, and orgies, like those things. So here is an encouragement then to live according to the Spirit. Live according to the Spirit. Because the only way to live is to live according to the Spirit. Led and guided and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you who believe. All who are in Christ are dwelt by the Holy Spirit. In fact, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. You dear believers, oh dear believers, you are in the Spirit. He is in you. He dwells in you. And so the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Carry on. Patience. 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Bible says there is no law that can be against the fruit of the Spirit. No one will take you, no one will sue you for bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in us and Christ too dwells in us, verse 10. Therefore, live according to the Spirit. And those who are in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. Is what Galatians 5.24 says. So do not continue to live as guided by your flesh and its appetites. Instead, listen to the Spirit. Instead, follow the Spirit. Instead, live as He guides you. He will guide you in accordance with the will of God. And He will take you to glory, I assure you. The Spirit will. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He is our, our paraclete. The advocate. He is the seal in us to guarantee our inheritance. He sanctifies and prepares us for the glory to come. And all that the Spirit of God does in us is meant to keep us alive in Christ. This is what is truly life. For life is only found in God by His Spirit. So a number of things then. Please, I beseech you, believe. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Or you have to. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. See, there is an entirely new mindset of the regenerated nature produced by the Spirit in Christians. There is a new mindset. Because to live according to the Spirit is to set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Verse 5. And what are the things of the Spirit? These are the spiritual things that are from the Spirit. For example, the Scriptures are things of the Spirit because the Word is authored by the Spirit of God. Holy men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians 5.22 is a spiritual thing because the Spirit produces the fruit in us. So the question then, the second question is, what do we produce by the Spirit? The Spirit, is at, uh, the Spirit who is at work in every Christian, every minute, uses His Word and our consciences either to accuse you or convict you of your sin. So when he accuses you, he convicts you of your sin. And when he excuses you, he convinces you of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the passage before us shows us what the Spirit produces in us. And that is life and peace. True life is only possible in God, who is the giver of life. Christ is the resurrection and the life, isn't he? He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one can get to the Father except through him. Life in view here is his spiritual life. And spiritual life is the same as eternal life. How is the Spirit, how is the Spirit going to be life? The Spirit is life because of righteousness. They are in verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. For He is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. He is the giver of life, true life, eternal life. Remember how Ezekiel graphically describes the work of the Spirit in the valley of dry bones. They are in Ezekiel 32, 37. When the Spirit blew, the bones came together, and the sinews, and the flesh, and eventually they became alive, and there was an army. The Spirit gives life. But the Spirit also gives life, uh, peace, excuse me. The Spirit produces peace. 
It can be said that the, the Spirit produces peace in everyone who is in Christ because the Spirit of God gives, applies the work of the Prince of Peace so that you are in the, Prince of, in the Prince of Peace, bearing peace as the fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit of God enables one to live in God, He enables that wonderful reconciliation with God to take place so that there is peace with God. There is peace with God. You remember earlier on in chapter 5, Paul spoke about peace with God when he said, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, what do we have? What do we have? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is interesting to note that peace is placed after life. The mindset of spirit-controlled people is that they are alive to God and so alert to spiritual realities and thirsty for God, His kingdom, and its righteousness. These people also enjoy peace of God reigning in their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. They're in Philippians 4, 6. So we have peace with God, that is reconciliation, and we have the peace of God in our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus so that they are anxious of nothing and they are not worried at all. If of course you live in worry and are plagued by anxiety, then it is unlikely that you know not the peace of God. Therefore, here is an encouragement for you to evaluate your deeds and attitudes in the radiance of God's purity. And so you ask the question, are you in the flesh or in the spirit? Do you live to please God or to gratify the desires of the flesh? Because there can be no mistaking between the two. Just one cannot confuse between the living and the dead. No one can. You cannot confuse light and darkness even when you're blind. They are unmistakable. It's a way of application then. First of all, stop indulging, gratifying the flesh. The Lord taught in the Sermon on the Mount that we shall know them by their roots. We shall know them by their leaves. We shall know them by their fruits. And he said grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor fig trees, excuse me, no figs from thorn bushes. A healthy tree bears good fruit, but a, dis a deceased tree bears bad fruit. While a good tree bears good fruit, and bad tree produces bad fruit. What is the relevance of this to the text before us? Consider your desires what you like, your hobbies. Evaluate them. Are you indulging in the flesh or are you walking by the Spirit? Consider your entertainment plan if you have one. Is it a session of indulging the flesh? Or is it a session of pursuing things of the Spirit? What is it that you do with your free time? How much are you involved in the life of other believers who are spirit-filled and spirit-led? Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Second thing. What is needed is to be intentional, be deliberate in seeking even the thing. Paul tells the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek 
the things that are above, where Christ Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. Because you see, you died in the flesh and you live in the spirit, hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Is that true? Let me ask you, what are you the most intentional and deliberate about? I can give you one. I know you are very, very intentional and deliberate with your career. You don't want to lose your job, isn't it? So you're not going to turn up tomorrow at work at 10 a.m., or will you? Your employer says, report at 8, you will be there. You will be there. You're very deliberate about that, aren't you? Is that how you're deliberate about life, things of heaven? It's a question. You know the answer. You're also very, very deliberate about your appetite, what you eat. So you had breakfast this morning, didn't you? And you plan to eat not so long from now. And later on in the evening, you will feed your body because you don't enjoy the pangs of hunger, do you? But let me ask, how deliberate are you in feeding your spirit. You feed your body perhaps three times a day. Isn't it? How many times do you feed your soul with the bread of heaven? Well, some of you tell me, Pastor, I'm really lagging behind with my Who has ever been so busy has to not eat for a week? Yes? Time would not allow you to sit down and eat, prepare food and eat. Who? And you could say at the end of the week, that week I've been busy, I did not find any time. Who is that? No one. But how many here have been so busy that the whole week they did not dust their Bibles? In fact, it wasn't until Saturday morning that they asked, and where is my Bible? It was left in the car, or it was left in some place. You could barely remember where it was, and perhaps you even turned up today at church without your Bible. Because you've been busy. I can tell you what else you've been very deliberate about. You've been very deliberate following the outcome of the elections, haven't you? Everyone has, even me. That's the way it is. We want to know whether you should go out or not. But as you sought to consult the media to tell you how far things have gone, how much did you consult the campus to glory? How much? How much did you pray? How much did you call your fellow believers with whom you're holding hands to Zion? How much? I can go on and on. There are things that you're very deliberate about. True? I know you have the capacity, the strength, and the energy to be deliberate and intentional about the things of heaven. So please be that that. And finally, set your mind on Christ. Set your mind on Christ. Whatever you do, fix your eyes on Christ who is the author and the perfecter of your faith. Stop engaging in anything else more than Christ. Put on Christ. Involve Christ. 
And this involves being involved in, in, in knowledge after the image of Christ. Learn to put on Christ as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, giving one another. That's how Paul tells the Colossians to put on Christ. The Lord helps.